The concept of computing dates back to the early Mayans and Egyptians using strings of beads to count. But in this case, we are talking about electronic computing. The first electronic computer built was the ENAC in 1943, also known as Colossus because it took up an entire room. In the following years, other computers were created on the same concept, like the Seri Rand, the Univac, and the Typhoon. Most of these were located at universities and funded by entrepreneurs or the government. Even then, they were room-sized and had to be operated by an electronic engineer because no one else knew what they were. A talking point for cocktail parties, at best bragging rights, that one could afford to fund an engineer. Here in this picture from Rand, it is suggested that people will have home computers by 2004, and in 1960, they had not progressed much. However, implementing the introduction of a tape recording system, like a court recorder. In the words of Arthur C. Clarke, from the book The Light of Other Days, published in 2000, What I see is a man with a new gadget, Hiram. Do you really believe a gadget can change the world? But gadgets do, you know. Once it was the wheel. Agriculture, iron making, inventions took thousands of years to spread around the planet. But now it takes a generation or less. Think about the car, the television. When I was a kid, computers were giant walk-in wardrobes served by a priesthood with punch cards. Now we spend half our lives plugged into soft screens, and my gadget is going to top them all. The idea of the mainframe is born. With the IBM 1401, the first computer to sell 10,000 copies, all to the government, which consisted of the central processor, the input-output controller, the tape controller, the magnetic tape units, the disk storage, or a fancy name for a shelf, the control console, as you can notice, was nothing more than a typewriter on a desk, the card reader and card punch, as well as a printer. All in all, nothing more than a word processor, a replacement for a typewriter, or if you wish, texting on a cell phone. The 1970s and 80s were no better for computing, with improvements on the same design of a mainframe for a word processor. A mainframe supports multiple workstations who can send and receive text only with other users from the same mainframe. There was no internet with which to connect computers. Rather, users had to make use of Morse code and telegraphy technology, or the telephone, to send and receive messages and then input them into the mainframe. Package technology, which drives the internet, wasn't invented until the 1960s, and even then it was only used by the Navy and not available to corporations or civilians. It wasn't until the 1990s that the Navy gave it to IBM to improve it, who in turn gave it to Bill Gates, who added color to it and then stole it. But that is the story of the internet, so we will stick to our theme of computers. Here's a picture of my father and I about six months before we invented computers in 1984. I at eight years old. What, 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 you say? Didn't they have computers in 1984? Like this reference in Superman 3 with Richard Pryor from 1983. Or even Whoopi Goldberg in Jumping Jack Flash from 1986. Again, both computers referenced in these movies are mainframes and had less computing power than a calculator watch. But didn't they have home computers available to civilians by then, you were thinking? Like this IBM XT or this Apple Lisa, again, which have less power than a calculator watch and were basically a glorified typewriter or word processor, as the name was coined. The Apple II was released in 1984 and advertised as a portable computer which came with a word processor software and could be hacked to run Linux, but again, had a max cache of 2 megabytes. That's about 200 pages of text. A glorified calculator. With low production, the Apple II didn't distribute to the public until nearly 1990. Here's where the problem originated in 1984 that led my father and I to invent the first computer on accident. A 10-key calculator, which was a staple commodity of every secretary in the 1980s. It had 10 keys and a printer on the back to keep a record of invoices and sales receipts. The only problem was a 10-key calculator cost $200 about two weeks' pay for a labor employee in 1980, and the main component which made it function was a mechanical relay, which used an electromagnet to open and close a switch made out of brass and copper, which did the actual counting for the calculator. When the brass wore out after two months, the relay quit working and had to be taken to an electronics repairman who charged $200 for parts and labor to fix it, thus illustrating the paradox 
that it was cheaper and less of a hassle to buy a new calculator every two months, which in the end cost $1,200 a year, a higher cost than most businesses could afford. So the problem was how to make a 10-key calculator economical. I watched my father puzzle over this idea for two years until one day when I was going into a convenience store, I saw the Infrade doorbell and I asked my father, what is a mechanical relay in basic terms? And he said, a switch. And then I said, what is an infrared doorbell at a convenience store? And he said, an LED that transfers infrared light to receiver and sets off an alarm when the circuit is interrupted. And I said, isn't that a switch? After three months of fiddling, he had four infrared LEDs with a basic power circuit in a Whitman's CAMD sampler box, hooked up to a 9-volt battery and was eternally frustrated because it didn't work. So I said to my dad, maybe the light from one LED is bleeding to the receptor of another LED. Why don't you cut a brass tube and stick the LED and receptor in either end to block the light? And he said, brass tubing is expensive. I'll use tape. Go figure, 1980s logic. For another two weeks, he wrestled with masking tape before upgrading to an opaque duct tape. And voila, Computing was born. He took his duct tape crap in a candy box down to Berkeley and got a trial against the chess playing computer Deep Blue, which was still the size of a room, as you can see here from these two nodes in this picture, about five feet tall. The crap in a candy box beat Deep Blue in ribbons, reducing its time to a fraction of a second, since light travels at, duh, the speed of light. The government confiscated it, which they made a movie about, Real Genius in 1985 with Val Kilmer. My life is not nearly that glamorous. The press went bananas and demanded that they be allowed to post my picture on every newspaper, magazine, radio, and TV show, which my parents denied on the basis that the damages of child celebrity causes. So the press went sulking off and printed libel about me using the name of this man, Bobby Fischer, an actual chess master using the symbolism of Deep Blue's defeat and my relative age, which was rather fortunate because trends in public opinion changed and in 1989 I was accused of causing a national recession. In reality, this was caused by the end of the Cold War and thus the arms race, ending 50 years of stockpiling and leaving one-third of the nation unemployed, to which I was placed on probation until I was 18, which they also made a movie about, Hackers, with Angelina Jolie in 1995 also severely glamorized and historically inaccurate, because the internet didn't exist back then. The argument was that I didn't earn the honorary PhD in computer science and aerospace engineering from Berkeley, and thus had to go to an accredited college to see just how hard it was to graduate. Eventually, the computer resurfaced in Hollywood in 1990 as a product of silicone graphic computers, SGI running IRIC software and advertised as a MIPS processor. With 36 LEDs and receptors, since the original concept was built on the schematic of a mechanical relay, but as a computing processor, it was not limited to the original four switches of the 10-key calculator. When the SGI came on the scene, things changed forever, most notably in Hollywood, as first introduced in Michael Jackson's video, Black or White, using face morphing. Then, in Terminator 2 in 1991, and after that, Jurassic Park in 1993. This is quite impressive when compared to its contemporaries of computer-generated film like Tron and The Last Starfighter, generated on a Cray computer designed in 1976, pictured here. Also room-sized and consumed massive amounts of power, each frame of The Last Starfighter took nearly three days to compute which in a 27 frame per second video computes to three months of processing for every one second of film. Alas, the SGI was still censored, not available to civilians. Only the government and corporations proving over two million in revenue over the last two years. However, from the time of its beginning in 1984 until today, the MIPS has never been improved on, with a 36 bank processor generating 10 gigs of processing power per millisecond. It had to be downclocked to 2 gigs per millisecond so users could interact with it, holding the crown until its slower silicone counterpart finally caught up in the early 21st century with the implementation of combined RAM, video, 
and the CPU generating 10 gigs of power. Which brings me to an important question, why? First we will describe a microchip, which differs from a microprocessor in that it is static or does not have the ability to move its path of circuitry. I understand it is more complex, but for this illustration, the model shown here will do. The electricity is piped in one of the legs of the microchip and comes out another leg or legs. There is a uniform set map to microchips, but I don't remember it. No matter how many times you run the simulation, the circuit always follows the same path. In the beginning, arcade video games used a series of microchips to imitate the illusion of freedom, but in fact are just an intricate system of pre-planned images. A silicone processor, even today, is based on the same microchip technology, as can be seen from this CG special effect from the beginning of the film Black Hat in 2015 showing the internal components of a CPU as a series of predefined circuit paths, while giving the illusion of an ability to create color, still identify pixels in a dot matrix system to form images. At first, the MIPS processor was implemented in robotic assembly lines, like these complex ones featured in Kia and Tesla Motors. The benefit of a robotic assembly line are, first, that the cost of production is lower, eliminating the human factor, and second, that parts can be made smaller without the constraints of human hands. This was first immediately noticed in 1980s by the distribution of television, or rather, color television. With smaller parts and lower cost, color TVs flourished in middle-class civilian homes. As I recall, my family didn't have a TV until the robotic production boom of the late 1980s. Our invention has directly introduced the distribution of six household items in every American home, those being the color TV, cell phone, video game, computer, digital alarm clock, and car engine ECU. Not bad for a kid who wore his sister's hand-me-down clothes and made his own toys from garbage because his family was so poor they couldn't afford school lunch, and I had to bag lunch it through high school. I didn't see my invention again until 2006, when it was released in the PlayStation 3 by Sony. The first day, Sony released 2 million units, which sold worldwide in the first four hours. $1.6 trillion in sales. Imagine my feelings that people were trampling each other to get their hands on a toy I built out of garbage 22 years ago, that today I myself could not afford. Eventually, Sony reinstituted the silicone processor because apparently engineers were too lazy to write a script to make IRIX emulate Windows so that their games would load without a video card. Which brings me to another point of comparison between the two. Silicone processors produce heat and thus require a fan to cool them, which requires electricity to run and components to support, all in all costing more to produce and operate. I don't have a degree in economics, but wouldn't it make sense to use a circuit that used less parts and less electricity? Since, after all, infrared light emitting diodes emit ultraviolet light, which doesn't produce heat. Which about wraps up my dissertation on the origins of computers as we know them today. Except the part where the Justice Department forgot I was on probation after 20 years because of the ongoing Iraq War, and the Department of Veterans Affairs denied my college scholarship. So, I ended up having to ask for a presidential pardon for missing a movement during a time of war. To, of all places, college. So, every time you see someone climaxing over checking their email or voguing over the novelty of using a cell phone, and you wonder how bipedal mammals ever reduced the art of communicating ideas or experiences into text-based throat noises, 
purely for the purpose of making text-based throat noises, then you'll know it's because of computers, which are nothing more than a typewriter, a telephone, and a calculator, while giving the illusion of something more, are just a practical tool. So among the playlists of this YouTube page, I trust the information identifies that I do in fact have the knowledge and experience comparable to a degree in computer science, thus fulfilling my debt to society and the stipulations of my probation.
what a terrible dream.